I'm proud to say that today's video is brought to you by Magellan TV. This is the new documentary streaming service which was created by actual filmmakers and their studios to showcase their passion for a variety of topics. Magellan TV has an incredible library of movies, documentaries, and exclusive playlists. This includes content on biographies, science, crime, and my favorite, history, which happens to come in a variety of eras from the ancient all the way to the modern. The content is brought to you without interruption or ads and is available in 4K without any additional cost. If you get a chance, I would highly recommend checking out their content on the Normans and the Norman Conquest. This is a fascinating time period in history. I also like the idea that the videos can be watched anywhere and on any platform, including my phone. Now if you click on the link below, you can not only help out my channel, but you can also get your first month free. So hit that link and begin your journey with Magellan TV today. And now for the video you've been waiting for. The Byzantine Empire had survived the Great Siege of 717. The city on the Bosphorus stood defiantly, protected by the mighty Theodosian walls. While the Umayyad were still formidable, the fortunes of the empire and the caliphate would eventually swing in the favor of the Romans. Internal strife and civil war would grip the caliphate, and in the year 750, this civil war that had engulfed the entire Islamic world would come to a bloody end. The Umayyad, who were powerful enough to nearly bring the Eastern Romans to their knees, were overthrown, and the Abbasid Caliphate was established. The Abbasid claimed a closer bloodline to the Prophet Muhammad, and thus they justified their actions. These new rulers would systematically hunt down and kill any remaining member of the Umayyad dynasty that they could find. To further cement their rule, they would even change the capital of the caliphate. In 762, the seat of government was moved from Damascus to Baghdad on the banks of the Tigris, near what was once the Persian city at Tesiphon. And then, for the next 150 years, the Abbasid dynasty would ascend into a time of prosperity. Baghdad would become a center of learning that rivaled Constantinople, and historians would later regard this as the Golden Age of Islam. The accumulated knowledge brought in from the vast trade routes of the Caliphate and, of course, the cultures which it bordered, would be gathered here and stored. Even the works of the ancient European scholars, like Aristotle, which were held in high regard, were here translated into Arabic, disseminated through the Islamic world, and were later debated by intellectuals like the famed Averroes of the 12th century. Under the reign of Harun al-Rashid, the fifth Abbasid Caliph, the Caliphate would reach its peak. Harun al-Rashid was a shrewd leader who commanded powerful armies. His diplomats kept the Byzantine in line, established close ties with the Tang dynasty of China, and even delivered a water clock to the court of Charlemagne. Baghdad under his reign would become a beacon of enlightenment as the Caliph spent generously on art, architecture, and building projects. This included the construction of the Grand Library of Baghdad, known as the Bayat al-Hikmah, but despite all their cultural achievements, the Abbasid would never rule a territory as vast as their predecessors. Their caliphate was destined to fragment and eventually fall, a process which was only accelerated after the death of Harun al-Rashid. The fragmentation of the Abbasid caliphate came quickly and early. Shortly after the Abbasid came to power in 750, a lone prince of the Umayyad, Abd al-Rahman I, would manage to escape the deadly persecution of his family. By one account, he even had to swim across the mighty Euphrates to escape his assassins. 
He traversed the breadth of North Africa to arrive in Al-Andalus and there established the independent Emirate of Cordoba in 756. But the Iberian Peninsula was not alone. Morocco and much of the Maghreb would break away from the Abbasid in the late 8th century. And on the eastern front, Khorasan and Persia would establish self-rule by the mid to late 9th. In time, the Fatimid Caliphate, who hailed from the Shia sect of Islam, would be established in North Africa, and by the 10th century had created a powerful state centered in Egypt. Going into the 11th century, Abbasid power was at best quickly becoming ephemeral. Even the once shining capital was now vulnerable. In the year 1055, the Seljuk Turks would occupy Baghdad, and in 1258, the Mongols would destroy it. It was said that the sands of the city went red with the blood of the slain, and the Tigris became black with the ink of the books that were thrown into the water to be destroyed. This turmoil in the Islamic world gave the Byzantine Empire room to breathe once again. Meanwhile, back in Constantinople, Leo III, the man who had defended the great city in 717 and had annihilated an Umayyad army at the Battle of Akroinon in 740, would go on to establish the Assyrian dynasty. Strangely enough, despite his military successes, he was best remembered for the religious rift he created. Leo and many members of his dynasty were proponents of iconoclasm, that is, the banning of religious icons and imagery. John Julius Norwich explains just how well this went over with the people. Quote, Facing eastwards towards St. Sophia was the principal gateway to the imperial palace known as the Chalke Gate. Above the great bronze doors that gave the building its name, there arose a vast golden icon of Christ. It was this, the largest and most prominent icon in the whole city, that Leo selected to be the first to be destroyed. The popular reaction was immediate. The commander of the demolition party was set upon by a group of outraged women and killed on the spot. More demonstrations followed with widespread mutinies in both the army and the fleet. The emperor's European subjects, inheritors as they were the old Greco-Roman tradition, left their sovereign in no doubt to their own feelings. They loved and revered their images, and they were prepared to fight for them." End quote. Iconoclasm would continue to divide the empire for the next 150 years. But despite the chaos that it would cause, the Byzantine would begin to regain the initiative against its many opponents. Leo III's son, Constantine V, would better organize the provinces known as themes. This would increase efficiency and boost tax revenue. Field armies would be reconstructed around a more efficient system into battalions known as tagmata. And instead of always being on the defense, the empire under Constantine V's reign would once again take the offense. Areas in the Balkans, Armenia, and Syria would be regained by the descendants of the Assyrian line. However, this expansion would eventually be hampered by palace intrigue. Constantine VI, who would gain power as a mere child in the year 780, would have to contend with his own mother, Irene, who had ascended to the role of Empress Regent. Not wanting to let go of power once her son had matured, she plotted against him and eventually gained the upper hand. Constantine VI, after a prolonged period of fighting with his own mother, had to flee the city but he did not make it very far. He was captured quickly by Irene's men who had managed to infiltrate his personal guard. He was thus dragged back before her in the Imperial Palace in 797 where she had him blinded. But the process was done with such intentional cruelty and malice that Constantine would die of his wounds. The Empress Irene, however, would not last much longer herself she was deposed and then later exiled by other members of the aristocracy, and once again internal discord would grip the empire. It would not be until the mid-9th century that the empire would regain its momentum. Entering upon the esteemed stage was Michael III, an emperor who in his early years campaigned to restore the lost lands of his empire. 
But as time went on, Michael grew bored of campaigning and maintaining the civil bureaucracy, which he increasingly deferred to others. Instead, he indulged in the more hedonistic aspects that being the emperor brought. In fact, during the latter part of his reign, he gained the title, the drunkard. Well, perhaps not to his face. Norwich describes the man very eloquently, quote, Michael III was not entirely without qualities. By his early 20s, he was already a seasoned campaigner and his physical courage in the field was never in question. What he lacked was will. Content to leave the responsibility of government to others, he was unable to check his own moral decline. Among Michael's many unattractive habits was that of surrounding himself with favorites and cronies who would accompany him in wild roisterings through the capital. And for the record, one of these men was a rough and uneducated Armenian peasant named Basil." End quote. In Western Europe, social mobility was very limited. One was born into a certain strata of society and usually died in the same. In the East, it was very different, and Michael III's drinking buddy, Basil, was to be the extreme example of this. Basil was a self-made man. He was born a peasant, and even though it was suspected that he was of Armenian descent, he was brought up in or near Macedonia, giving him the later title, the Macedonian. It was said that he possessed an abundance of natural charm, good looks, and incredible strength. Engaging in several business enterprises, he gained a certain degree of wealth before he entered into the service of the emperor as essentially a stable boy. It was at this point that he came into contact with Michael III and impressed him. One story goes that Basil managed to subdue the emperor's prize stallion, whereas another account, which seems to be more credible, simply states that Basil made the ideal wingman and the perfect drinking companion. Either way, he arose through the ranks quickly, and when opportunity presented itself, he took full advantage. You see, at this point, Michael III had himself a mistress, and to throw off palace intrigue, he requested that Basil marry her. Basil married the beautiful consort and then found himself elevated to the level of co-emperor. He did, after all, take one for the team. By one estimate, he went all the way from stable boy to co-emperor in approximately nine years. And now that he had achieved his high level of standing, the Macedonian figured it was time to wipe out the competition. First, he framed his only major rival, Michael III's uncle, for treason and then killed the man himself. He then went on to usurp more and more power from his co-emperor. Finally, he decided it was time to get rid of all opposition. On September 24th in the year 867, Basil threw a splendid party for Michael III and got him insanely intoxicated. And later that night, he and eight of his friends followed the emperor to his bedchamber. And there he proceeded to have him executed, Julius Caesar style. As John Julius Norwich would say, Basil was relieved at last of the dead weight of his co-ruler. In this case, literally. But surprisingly enough for a man of such humble beginnings and of such ruthless ambition, and in complete opposition to his predecessor, Michael III, he turned out to be an excellent emperor. He revised the tax code known as the Basilica, reorganized the imperial armies, and then began a series of campaigns that would regain lands in Italy, the Balkans, and along the Eastern Front. The now Emperor Basil I, as history would remember him, even went so far as to initiate an ambitious building program which was described by Norwich as, quote, No new churches had been built, and many of the older ones had been neglected. A number were in urgent need of repair, including St. Sophia itself, which had been damaged in an earthquake in 869 and was now in imminent danger of collapse. Basil saved it in the nick of time. Many other humbler shrines were restored, but the emperor's greatest architectural triumph was his new church, which was always called just that, the Nia. If Basil was the Justinian of his day, this was his Saint Sophia. Few emperors did more to ensure that Constantinople remained the most opulent city in the world. 
It is a sad irony that in the whole of the city, there now survives of Basil's work, not one stone resting on another." End quote. Basil I would reign skillfully for 19 years and establish the Macedonian dynasty. Many historians regard this dynasty as one of the major high points for Byzantium in the Middle Ages. For more than 150 years, Constantinople would be ruled by resourceful and skilled rulers. The Eastern Roman Empire would enter into a period of restoration, perhaps not to the level of Justinian, but a renovatio imperii nonetheless. With the fracturing of the Abbasid Caliphate, the empire would expand east once again. By the 960s, Crete, Cyprus, and vast areas in Syria would fly the double eagle standard. This expansion would reach its apogee under a new emperor who came to power in 976. His name also happened to be Basil, and Norwich masterfully describes the man, quote, Basil impressed everyone by his quickness of mind and inexhaustible energy. He cut ceremonial to a minimum and wore work-a-day clothes quite unbefitting an emperor, and it was noted at times to be none too clean. He was short and stocky with a heavy beard and pale blue eyes. When not in the saddle, we are told his appearance was undistinguished. It was only when mounted, for he was a superb horseman, that he came fully into his own. Basil II, as he'd be known to history, led a life of quite exceptional austerity, eating and drinking sparingly and avoiding women altogether. Almost alone among Byzantine emperors, he never married. But from the moment he found himself the senior emperor, he was determined to rule as well as reign." End quote. Basil II was a very clever man. He reorganized the system in order to tax the rich which would make you think that would make him extremely unpopular. But instead, he figured out a way to manipulate the tax code in order to keep his aristocracy in line. The man was also very adept with his foreign negotiations. He made a tenuous peace with the emerging Fatimid Caliphate of Egypt. He did this in order to keep the Abbasid Caliphate off balance. Thus, with his eastern border now relatively secure, he made it a point of his foreign policy to wage an all-out war on the Bulgars to the west, who, under their new czar, Samuel, or Samuel, I've heard both, had grown both aggressive and powerful. Basil II's campaign began in total disaster when his army was ambushed and nearly destroyed at the gates of Trajan in 986. This set the emperor back considerably, in the wake of his defeat, the empire descended into civil war and rebellion. A powerful aristocratic family led by Bardas Phocas the Younger rose up and nearly took full power. But Basil II was not going to throw in the towel so easily. He began to look for new allies and in the process made a decision that would impact Eastern Europe forever. To the north, the Rus had also become very formidable and just happened to be in the market for a new religion. They were undecided between the various forms of Christianity and had even been approached by envoys from the Caliphate. Delegations were sent back and forth between the Rus and the Eastern Empire and an alliance was established in 988. Part of the deal was that they were to dispatch 6,000 elite warriors, known as the Varangians, to aid the emperor in his conflicts. Another stipulation was that Basil's daughter, Anna, would marry Vladimir, the Prince of Kiev, the next year, with, of course, the tiny caveat that the Rus would convert to Greek Orthodox Christianity. Vladimir was still debating his religious options and decided to send his ambassador to Constantinople to find out more about this religion. Roger Crowley in his book 1453 gives us the account of what the ambassador saw. Quote, it was the beauty of the liturgy in St. Sophia that converted Russia to orthodoxy after a fact-finding mission from Kiev in the 10th century. It was reported back, and these are the words of the ambassador, we know not whether we were in heaven or earth, for on earth there is no such splendor and beauty, and we are at a loss to describe it. We only know that there God dwells among men." End quote. 
Greek Orthodoxy thus became the official religion of the North. Meanwhile, Emperor Basil II would acquire the services of the elite troops, the Varangians, who by the way in time would become his own personal guard. With them, Basil was able to go on the offensive, crush his opposition, and end the civil war. The inspired emperor, who was now on a roll, would go on to wage war in Georgia, Armenia, and Syria, where he was able to regain a lot of lost territory even against the Fatimid who had used the Byzantine civil war to their advantage. Then Basil II turned once again to the west to attack his old adversary, the Bulgars. Now the exact details of his Bulgarian campaign are unknown, they're lost to time. But what is certain is that the campaign took well over a decade as one Bulgarian stronghold was defeated after another. As a contemporary chronicler would state, the Emperor Basil II continued to invade Bulgaria each year and destroyed and devastated everything on his way. Samuel could not stop him in the open field or engage the Emperor in a decisive battle, and thus suffered many defeats and began to lose his strength. The reality of the situation was that the fighting was inconclusive, with both sides winning numerous smaller battles, but nothing decisive. Now that said, the campaign reached its apogee in the year 1014. Basil II at the head of his army intended to march on the very heart of Bulgar territory, but in order to do so he needed to cross his army across several mountainous valleys. The Bulgarian Tsar Samuel, again also shows up in the history books as Samuil, had resourcefully built a strong wooden wall to block one of the valleys and had manned it with thousands of his soldiers. Basil II attempted to breach the wall with a direct assault. This met with stiff resistance and resulted in heavy Byzantine casualties. Seeing that the emperor was now blocked and getting his nose bloodied, the Tsar Samuel, instead of his usual hit-and-run tactics, decided to commit the bulk of his army to march in and reinforce his men at the wall. However, even as the Bulgarians were moving into position, Basil had come up with another strategy. He deployed a contingent of his forces to march along a high mountain pass along the ridge of the valley. This Byzantine force managed to move around the entire Bulgarian army and arrived in their rear thus effectively bottling them up inside the steep valley. When the Bulgars finally realized that they now had to fight on two fronts, their men began to lose cohesion and then all-out panic ensued, which was exactly what Basil needed. The Emperor launched another all-out attack on the wall, but this time he destroyed it. His troops then poured in on the trapped Bulgar army from both sides. At this point, it really wasn't much of a battle, but rather a mop-up operation. At what would later be known as the Battle of Clydion, the Eastern Romans won decisively. It was estimated that they managed to capture over 15,000 men. Basil, in order to prove a point, I guess, had the men rounded up and placed into groups of 100 men apiece, of which he had 99 out of every 100 blinded. The hundredth man was spared a single eye in order to lead the rest of the men back to their king. Now, according to chroniclers, when the Bulgar king or czar saw his troops, he was shattered and soon died afterwards of a heart attack or a stroke. The path was now open for the emperor to complete his conquest. By 1018, Basil had restored the Byzantine border to the Danube, and in the process he gained the title, the Bulgar Slayer. This would mark the high point of the Macedonian dynasty. Basil died in 1025, but he left the empire with a strong economy, secure borders, and an invigorated and thriving cultural scene that historians referred to as the Macedonian Renaissance. But Basil's greatest mistake was that he left no heir. Members of his family would come to power after him, however none possessed his skill or his zeal, or his talent. As a result, the economy declined, many of Basil's laws were overturned, and then new enemies both from a military and theological standpoint appeared. In the next 50 years, these problems would be compounded, 
and the fate of the empire, which had been doing fairly well, would be completely reversed. One of the greatest obstacles that came to a breaking point after Basil II's death was religion. Greek Christian orthodoxy was the backbone of Byzantium, but for centuries it had established a path that had relentlessly diverged from the Roman Catholic Church. From nearly the very beginning when Constantine made Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire, disagreements arose. Some of the arguments would surround differences in the interpretation of the Nicene Creed, whether or not the clergy should be celibate, the use of unleavened bread, and most importantly, if the Pope did indeed have supreme authority. Now some of this perhaps could have come down to problems with translation between Latin and Greek, where some of the letters don't match up and some of the words have different connotations. However, keep in mind that there were also major cultural differences between East and West, not to mention political problems that also caused a bunch of friction. For example, in 751, Ravenna was attacked and overrun by the Lombards. Rome was then vulnerable and asked the various kingdoms of Europe for help. The Byzantine did not come. Instead, Pepin the Short of the Carolingians answered the call. He sent his army into northern Italy, securing several cities which he would later hand over to the Pope. This strengthened the position of the Papal States. The Pope would reward the Carolingians by granting the role of Holy Roman Emperor to Pepin's son, Charlemagne. The Holy Roman Empire would then serve as a sort of counterbalance to the prestige of the Eastern Empire, which, as can be imagined, bred resentment. As time went on, the rift between the two churches only intensified. Roger Crowley, in his book 1453, describes the breaking point. Quote, on July 16, 1054, as the clergy was preparing for the afternoon liturgy in St. Sophia, three prelates stepped into the church. The men were cardinals of the Catholic Church sent from Rome by the Pope to settle theological disputes with their brothers in the East. But this afternoon, after lengthy and awkward negotiations, they had lost patience and were coming to take decisive action. The leader of this group carried in his hands a document whose content was to prove explosive for Christian unity. Advancing into the sanctuary, he placed a bull of excommunication on the great altar, turned smartly on his heels, and then walked out. As the cardinal made his way back into the brilliant summer light, he shook the dust from his feet and proclaimed, Let God look and judge. Two days later, the cardinals took a ship back to Rome. Violent religious rioting broke out in the streets that was only pacified by pronouncing anathema on the papal delegation. The offending document was publicly burned, but this incident was the start of a process known to history as the Great Schism, which was to inflict deep and lasting wounds on Christendom." End quote. 1054 was the official date given in the history books for the Great Schism, but this was a process that was centuries in the making and centuries in the presentation. In fact, the anathema that was pronounced that day would not be rescinded until 1965. This division for the Eastern Romans created a rival and a source of contention, even depriving them of a potential ally. This was disastrous. The people of Byzantium at this point in history needed every friend they could get. Crowley again explains why. Quote, Byzantium was an empire forever at war, and Constantinople, because of its position at the crossroads, was repeatedly pressured from both Europe and Asia. The Arabs were merely the most determined in a long succession of armies. The Persians and the Avars came in 626, the Bulgars repeatedly in the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries, and Prince Igor of the Russians in 941. Maintenance of the city walls was a constant civic duty. Granaries were kept stocked and cisterns filled. Siege was simply a state of mind for the Greek people." End quote. Entering into the mid-11th century, Byzantium was once again divided internally and isolated both religiously and politically, and all of this as a new threat had suddenly emerged. 
Fierce warriors of the Asian steppe who were powerful adversaries and determined to carve out an empire of their own had appeared, literally, on the horizon. They were known as the Seljuk Turks, and they would go down in history as breaking the back of the Eastern Empire. 